no one teaches you what to do with all that power. No one teaches you what to do with the sudden unwanted erection, all the sexual energy, the rage, the inability to feel your tears and your feelings like you might have felt even weeks before it happened. Your social group changes, the way your, your male friends treat you changes. So much shifts. And it goes out, usually for most boys, it goes away from a place of nurturing and tending and into a place of isolation and competition. Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mojica, a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. Okay, welcome everybody. I am really thrilled to be having this particular episode because I just spent the last nine months in a very special container with a group of beautiful male bodies learning so much about masculinity and sexuality and emotions and puberty and social conditioning and everything you can imagine. And I started this group for the first time publicly. I've done this work privately for a number of years and with one-on-one -on -one clients, but I really felt the need to do this on a bigger level. And so I put out the call about 25 men, well, 50 men answered it. 25 were, um, uh, what's the word accepted sounds like you know <laughs> a very exclusive word and it is because we only had 20 we only had 20 spots but i went up to five um but these men were accepted based on their intentions and these intentions were so deep and intimate and i felt like as i was reading these applications i was already feeling emotions and i was already being taken to this deep part of myself and that's what i use as the as the credit of who should come in so as I was seeing that, as I was feeling that, I thought, okay, him, 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 them, him. And we had got this amazing group and we spent nine months together and we learned a lot of different things. And I'm doing another one in January for six months and we're meeting more than the nine month one. So it's going to be actually more meetings in a shorter amount of time, but still a long six month group. And I'm always asking myself, what's the most relational way to promote something, to teach people about an offering? And this is my favorite way to bring people in who actually did it with me and want to describe their experiences and have a conversation. So the listener can attune to us and feel us out and see what awakens in them or what they feel in their own body around something like this, something unknown like this. So I'm going to begin just by letting everyone introduce themselves. I'll call on each person. So there's some, some semblance of uh, organization. And then we'll go into actually describing our experiences in this group and what others might want to want to know about it if they're thinking of joining and, and all of you listening who aren't going to all be able to join just how healing this session can be just to witness men talking about these things. So we'll see where it goes. But let's start with my beautiful facilitators. We'll start with Stephen. Tell us about, you know, I called you into this group. So maybe you can talk about the work you do in the world and a little bit about yourself and when you joined. Yes. Yeah, so my name is Stephen Rosofsky. And when you asked if I would be part of this experience, it took me about three seconds to say, absolutely. I would love to do that because men's work is such a big part of my life and working with men and sitting in circle, doing embodiment facilitation. And the way that you do it, Luis, and the tenderness you bring and the heart is something that has resonated with me since the moment I met you in a men's group. And so it's been such an honor to get to come and do this with you and, and meet such beautiful men and be in a space that's so open and honest where we get to explore with each other. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. Zach, and I just have to say, this is Zach's debut on the podcast, which is blows my mind because he's one of my dearest friends. And we, we, we have our own private podcast and like car rides and trips and in saunas. And so I just thought he was on. <laughs> he's never been on till now. So <laughs> welcome yourself, my love. Thank you, Luis. Yeah, for everyone listening, Luis has asked me so many times to be on this podcast, and I've gotten nervous and said I'm open to it. And this is the first time I said yes, and I was willing to. So I'm excited to be here. Um, my name is Zach Kalatsky, and I'm an entrepreneur and a somatic guide and a body worker and facilitator, and created this space called the Forest Haven in the Hudson Valley. It's a healing space in the area. And uh, 
thinking back on when I first met Luis, I knew how deeply I wanted to know him. And I knew how safe I felt immediately. And it felt like we were going to be brothers. And I didn't want to like call out the magic, but it's happened and it happened so quickly. And knowing Luis, knowing Steven, Steven's actually the first person to introduce me to men's work and went to a lot of different groups surrounding his circle and ultimately created my own to join in a lot of the pieces I was loving in the men's groups and some of the pieces I saw were missing. And that's where Steven and Luis met, I'm pretty sure, was in my space at a men's group. Fast forwarding, met Luis um, in this men's group, brought him to, or he brought me to join in with um, Steven and himself in this private men's group that we all created. And it felt so good, just the three of us, like holding each other and crying around a fire and sharing our like most intimate wants and details. Um, expanding on that comes this group. Luis invited me and similar to what Stephen was saying, the three second feeling of what it felt like. I just thought it would be play. It would be so much fun to join the three of us together again on the screen now that Stephen lives in Prague and you don't live very far away, but with your schedule, it's so hard to connect. So I am, I was elated immediately to be able to support and co-facilitate with you and yeah, I'm, I want to share more about the men's group itself and how it went, but I'm going to wait till later when that opens up. But for my intro, I think I'll leave it at that. So I'm so honored to be here to be supported and to support you all. Thank you so much, Zach. <laughs> Maddie, go ahead and tell us about you. Now we're going into participants. We heard the two facilitators with me. Now we're going into the participants of the group. Hello. I'm uh, Maddie Matt Walker, out here in the uh, Squaxin territory in Olympia, Washington. I'm an artist, a musician, and a writer. I've done all sorts of things for my day jobs, but that's really what I like to lead with. Is creativity is my my reason for being alive. Um, I, I I think everyone's as everyone will say. I'm, I was just thrilled when you announced the men's group. I had done a couple of your six week trauma healing workshops during the pandemic and um my my partner at the time terry hempfling had introduced me to louise's work and the podcast and it just really was everything that i was looking for and i've always felt very embodied but it was it was kind of the first time that i had really gone into somatics proper and started doing trauma healing work and um, besides just feeling into my body, started really engaging with some of the topics. So uh, after working with you a few times, and I'd always wanted to get into a men's group. A friend of mine had, had been doing one and it had really been helping him, but they weren't taking new members. And then, you know, life just kind of went by. So when you announced it, I, I just jumped at the chance. It was a perfect opportunity. And I've just been really enjoying it. Thanks, Maddie. Navid. Hello, friends. My name is Navid Heydari. Um, I am a somatic guide. I'm noticing the constriction just around saying that. It's a big topic we um, discussed in this group a lot. Um, I'm also um, a group facilitator. I've done primal play, authentic relating, a lot of activities that help us get into our bodies. Lately, I'm going to add on that I'm also a musician because I've been making incredible, uh, incredible songs that have helped me to move and relate to the uh, infinite amount of charge that flows through my body. Um, I was immediately drawn to this men's group after uh, leaving a somatic psychotherapy program in which we had um, about 40 people and uh, Ninety-five percent were female. There was maybe that's not the right percentage, but there was only three of us males, and I just felt this yearning to be learning about somatic work with other men, with other people who have the same amount of testosterone flowing through their body. So it was so so important for me to be here. I also had taken Luis's six-week course, which was very life-changing, 
And I just wanted to be your friend, Luis, let's be honest. I was like, how do I get more Luis in my life? Um, and since we don't live close to each other, I figured I would just join a men's group and and on my way to your friendship. <laughs> you already became my friend the moment I met you. So done. Thanks, David. Ian. Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Wood. My dad actually introduced me to men's work, men's circles when I was 13. So 25 years ago introduced me to the mankind project it's just been part of my life this this normal thing that i did with my dad and over the last maybe decade decade it's become more of my my own thing and i've realized that even deeply in men's work is there a lack of spaces to talk about sexuality it's actually really blown me away that whenever it comes up, it's the most profound thing I experience in men's spaces. And then it just disappears. It's like ephemeral and just phew, disappears. So I was running men's trainings online. I coach, I teach, I do programs. And now I'm like full force focused on working with men, sexuality, because I think it's, I just think it's it. And so when Luis open the doors for this. I was, I was all in. I just knew it from the, the second I heard about it and so grateful to learn from you, Luis, and be with all you beautiful men. It was, uh, there's just, there can't, there's so much room for this. There's so much room for this. And, uh, I just want to be a part of being with other men that are growing and expanding it. Yeah, I remember you, you, you snuck in, you were like the last one in, I think. And I was just so happy to have you part of it. I'm like, I'm getting you in here. There's no question. So I'm really glad you joined. And I just have to say, I remember um, sometimes I'll look some people up on Instagram, like when someone says, oh, you know, check out this person. So I, I looked up Navid one day and um, I saw this video of him laying shirtless on the ground with like some like massage tool all over his body singing into a microphone and immediately i'm like, okay that's a brother and then i read the caption and it was like i ate too many lentils and now i can't get anything done <laughs> because you know beans take away your adrenaline i just thought brilliant perfect like soulmate so <laughs> i had to put that, that plug out there for you Navid. um you know what happened for me at the very end of the men's group some because someone asked in our one of our last sessions like you know what was this like for you what was it like coming in what was so profound for me based on what ian just said was coming to this group as a bisexual intersex man i think that's why this group is very different from other men's groups because i don't have the typical male experience yet i am male so i have this strange in between uh biological ambiguity that greatly shaped my upbringing. So I was gifted with a greater sensitivity to the male puberty than I think the average man is because they don't have this huge contrast of, like in my experience, having all this estrogen until I was 15 and then suddenly huge bursts of testosterone. So I felt this big difference. And I'd, I've said in the past, the only other bodies I've met on this planet that have felt that are either intersex or trans men. They're the only ones that really get that big contrast of how testosterone changes so much inside of you. So when Avi was saying to be in a group of people with testosterone flowing through their bodies, when I made this group, I was really very, it felt very important to me that there was a piece around biology with it, which is very controversial these days. And I'm a huge trans ally, people know this, yet when it comes to talking about the puberty of a, of a little boy, it's very different than what a trans man or a trans woman would go through. And so I wanted to really have a space where we could go into the puberty because as a trauma therapist, I discovered how much shifted for us in puberty and how traumatic puberty really, really is and how there's virtually no spaces, especially for boys to even go and talk about that. And the most traumatic thing about it is that one of the key pieces of testosterone is how it pulls you away from your emotional self as it's coming in. So suddenly, you know, you live your life as this kind of 
in a way, very non-dual, you know, asexual boy body. And then suddenly this testosterone starts flooding in and everything starts to change inside of you. And no one teaches you what to do with all that power. No one teaches you what to do with the sudden unwanted erection, all the sexual energy, the rage, the inability to feel your tears and your feelings like you might have felt even weeks before it happened. Your social group changes, the way your your male friends treat you changes. So much shifts. And it goes out, usually for most boys, it goes away from a place of nurturing and tending and into a place of isolation and competition. And so what it, it what really excited me was to go into this group and see so many uh, straight men typically applied for this group and to be in a, a group with them and to bring these ideas in and to see the relief on so many of their hearts and faces to be able to talk about their puberty experiences like some of the most shameful things no one would ever say ever to anybody. And we all held them because we're like, oh, me too, me too, me too. So I wanted to start there just to kind of ask you all, what was that experience like for you in this group in particular? What was it like to navigate puberty with other men through a somatic and trauma lens? What did you learn? What do you want to add? Go ahead, Naveen. Yeah. Um, the puberty week. Um, this is this, by the way, was a slow somatic men's group, which I think is really radical too. So I called it a puberty week, but actually it was a puberty month because we would take these topics one giant month block at a time, um, which for my system, um, I often felt resistance to that. Like I wanted more i wanted more that part of me there yeah, give me more and more and more but actually the slowness um, created a lot more space for integration and a lot of magic in my world and a lot of um, things showing up in my world during that month so i just wanted to name that um and and sorry if you were going to say that Luis, but um just wanted to say that was really impactful and and i think it was month three that we went into puberty and i felt something change within our group I feel like y'all remember that as well. Um, that was um, a time when I probably felt the most amount of um, unshaming, as David Bedrick would say, or uh, kind of radical self-acceptance. I had all these coping strategies, all this history with masturbation, just hearing how similar the experiences of these other men um, it just relieved this veil. And, um, and in many ways, I'm still going through puberty because this rite of passage hasn't, it hasn't found its completion yet because there's been a lack of mentorship and a lack of self, um, self love that can help usher me in with, with a great amount of, um, respect and, um, and, and understanding for like, Oh, this is why I've been choosing what I've been choosing. This is why I'm drawn to these types of relationships where I'm constantly like seeking out a, a partner to um, help me to like be with this high amount of charge because I haven't been able to um, relate to my own charge in a way that makes me feel good or in a way that um, I can leave with a certain amount of acceptance. So, so that month in particular, when we spoke about puberty, and, and what we did during that time, and thus what we are still doing now, because those patterns have stuck with us. Um, yeah, it really was probably the most impactful part of this course. And when Navid says what we did with that time, it's, it's like when we think about puberty, you know, through the, the soma, especially through the nervous system, it's so much force, especially what's attached to testosterone. It, lots of adrenaline comes from testosterone. So a really kind of hyper vigilant, hyper active, sexually and full body aroused self, which is very new. And so many of us boys are alone in that sudden, what's the word I'm looking for, like surge of power that we don't know what to do with it. And it's a power that moves outwards. Like the very flow of masculine doesn't mean man or woman for me. It just means the outward flow of energy and testosterone forces things to grow outwards, you know 
everything, every part of the body. So it's fascinating that we suddenly get filled with this electricity that's forcing us outward. No one teaches us what to do with it. There's no bodies to reflect how to relate to it, like Navid's saying. And in that isolation, it goes in really strange directions. It gets distorted. It goes toward us. It goes toward others. It dominates. It does all these things that we tend to call toxic masculine. But what it really is is unconscious masculine, like disembodied masculine. How do I learn how to relate to that energy that's moving out of me suddenly that no one has prepared me for? So I'm so glad you brought that in. And I also felt a huge shift in the group. All the politeness went out the window that month. It was like we finally were like, we were like blood siblings, it felt like. So I, I'm, I'm glad you felt that too. Go ahead, Maddie. Yeah, the puberty uh, month was amazing, transformative, as you all have said. But what I wanted to contribute is I thought it was just interesting how everyone had these very, of course, intimate experiences in their puberty, learning about their bodies and relating to other boys in their community that they're friends with. Um, I just, it just felt almost like everyone had these super private, unique, special experiences, whether good or bad, but it, it was just so eye-opening that so many of them were so similar and experience that I had had that was, you know, just really deep down and very personal. It was amazing to share that with other men and be seen for that. But also to have so many others being like that exact same thing was something that I experienced too. So that was just not only a really bonding moment within the group, but also just an eye opener. And it's just so grounding knowing that, you know, even though it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, like that I wasn't alone. And that was just, just so talk about unfurling. That was just a really beautiful moment of some serious, um, substantial unfurling. I just really loved. So gorgeous. Ian. Oh, I just had so much come to me as as everyone's been talking. And what I felt was it was collecting these all all these fragmented parts of self. Like the word that came to mind was the lost boys, the lost forgotten boys, and, and like revisiting them and be like, oh yeah. I remember that guy. I remember that guy. And this other idea, you know, I've learned so much from you, Luis, and it's just changed my whole perspective on men and masculinity to, to hear what you've shared about testosterone. It's just like, and I was sitting here thinking about it. It would be like giving someone MDMA and judging them for the way that they behaved. Like that's what we go through in this stage of puberty. We have all these chemicals and it's like, and we get lost in judging ourselves for our behavior, for the drugs that have been in hormones that have been released in our blood. You know, it's just crazy. So there was so much liberation and, and it's kind of like, I want to run around waving this flag of, of freedom for young boys that have no one teaching them what to do with this just like superpower that's being demonized. So there was just so much liberation in, in me feeling connected to men and masculinity and that there's just so much missing wisdom. As you're saying that, I'm hearing like that statement drunk on power. And when you're, I love how you're bringing MDMA because that's really what's happening. Like we're getting drunk, like intoxicated on this masculine power in us. We don't know what to do with it. And so we, we tend to do, especially in my generation, pretty horrible things with it because the only experiences of men that I had growing up were like WWF. You know, it was like, it was what I call the cinematic drag kings. So it was like these huge, you know, extremely strange fragments of what it means to be male. Total camp, by the way, looking back on WWF, I'm like, that's camp, like it's actual drag kings. <laughs> you know, having like a campy, filthy experience. Now I actually enjoy it. But growing up, I was like, I'm supposed to be that. And I saw all my friends go from these really kind of like sensitive boys into this kind of like dominating, dominating, rageful bodies because that was all they knew what to do with that energy. So I, I just appreciate that. Really appreciate that. Steven. I also definitely felt the shift that month three 
I think death is one of those topics that when you bring out death, it's like, let's just put it all on the table. No more masking here. And I think puberty might be a pretty close second there with us all going through this experience and being a little bit lost with having no one to talk to, as we've many of us have mentioned. And I remember watching the Netflix show a couple of years ago, Big Mouth, which is on the topic of puberty and thinking, oh my gosh, finally something in mass culture is showing these experiences and helping us feel a little bit less alone in it. And then to get to do something like that live with other men and take a risk and say, hey, this is my first experience with masturbation. Hey, this is this is what shifted for me with other boys where before puberty, it was okay to touch other boys in a loving, gentle way. And then something shifted and the story came in that boys are no longer allowed to touch each other unless you're fighting, you're competing, and there's a winner and a loser, and then it's okay to touch. And to see men share these things and to take the risk and to, and to feel the charge come up, right? The nervousness. Is it okay to share this in front of a group? And then to see the group just receive it supportively. Luis, for you to bring in the pause, I think that's been one of the most beautiful tools to allow men to pause in that moment of, of being vulnerable and feeling the charge and then not being alone in it. And I would check in with some men at the end of sessions and I'd say, how long have you been alone with that? And sometimes they would say 20, 30 plus years. And that to me was so beautiful to, to get to witness and to see the relief and the release that would come from saying, okay, it's, it's actually safe. And I'm having an experience of trust now because I put myself out there and nothing bad happened. In fact, I feel closer to the people around me. You know, what Stephen just said, like just touching what Naveed said earlier, like when Naveed was saying he was in a space with like 95% women, you know, I've taught thousands literally of people around the world through my six week course. I think, I think maybe we've had like two or three dozen men and that's pretty intense. Okay. And I'm a man. So you think, okay, maybe more would come. Nope. So it, these spaces around uh, connecting to pain and working with trauma and talking about sexuality and emotions are very rarely men's spaces unless it's a men's group. And every time I've gone to a men's group, it's been extremely intellectual. And I haven't felt that like feminine drop into my bones and my womb that I wanted to have, you know, in these men's men's groups. So what Stephen just said was important to me because I heard the art or the practice of isolation. And that's what so many men have. They have the practice of isolation. They have the art of isolating themselves and doing these things alone. So being in a group where you're in your body with other men is like a huge jump from just being in a group where you're talking about things with other men, being in your body. When he says the pause, you feel each other. You cry watching the other one cry. Your heart opens watching the other one weep. Someone yells and you're, you're, something constricts. Like you're in this visceral mycelial connection, even online. And I find that to be a really radical way to kind of like unfold from this compressed, what we would call like toxic masculine patriarchal system. To unfold from that comes through feeling each other, feeling that it's safe to feel each other. And that was one of my greatest traumas growing up was these boys suddenly couldn't touch me unless they were sexually assaulting me or fighting with me. That was the only time they were allowed to touch me. That's huge. That's a big extreme. So it, it's amazing that that nuance, that intimacy, platonic or sexual intimacy with men is so feared when puberty comes in, when testosterone comes in, when the conditioning arrives. So it's been it's been like such an, a privilege to watch these men over these nine months like come into the space and you can see on their face how much more comfortable they feel with each other and how something opens but when Stephen was saying that like how long have you been alone with that that was a really powerful question because we've been alone with so much that we didn't even know we were allowed to talk about and that goes to that unshaming like Navid brought in earlier Zach what are you feeling what are you sitting with yeah, so much is coming up. I'm going to try to keep it cohesive and and brief, knowing our time. Um, 
based on everything you've shared. And of course, the the puberty month was so potent as we've all shared here. Like that was the the month that really brought us together. Um, thinking like back to my own puberty and being an Orthodox Jew in puberty and what that looks like where it's ritualized with just reading from a scroll, semi-embarrassed to speak a language that is not my first language in front of, of so many people. And then you're a man, you put these leather straps on your arm, on your crown, and you're a man now. It's like, oh, great, what does that mean? There's no answer for that, but you're a man. And this men's group and that month in particular, the re-ritualization of puberty and talking about it with a group of men that predominantly feel comfortable around women. I think that was a, a connecting thread for all of us. We all mentioned that being around men is unsafe, uncomfortable. We've been hurt by it. And we were able to share these deep inner feelings from our childhood. And I, that moment was was really safe for my inner child to be able to share with men that all feel safe around women. And we're all here sharing our femininity in male bodies. So that's what really, it really touched me in that. And I think back to, um, I'm trying to think how to say this, but the, the competition over collaboration as, as a puberty ritual, <laughs> right? I don't like that it's true, but I remember back to right when I hit puberty and was started, started wanting to be intimate with women. I remember my best friend secretly hating me and trying to hurt me because he liked her. And then in this group, anything we shared was so collaborative. It was collaboration over competition where we share about these innermost secrets around puberty and the shame. And all of us are here to collaborate, hold space, throw up, emojis of little hearts, you know, do little like hand waves so we can all love on each other and support each other. And something that you mentioned, Luis, that was so deep and touching throughout the whole experience was your connection of nature to the penetrative nature of masculinity and testosterone. And that softened everything in me. It also like held my inner child of the idea of roots are penetrative yet it's a slow and sensual and gentle process into this soil to ultimately grow up and create this beautiful tree and connecting that to masculinity was such a, a light in my body and then being able to see everyone on the screen also like grow with that and be like oh it doesn't mean we need to be perpetrators to like love something to penetrate someone to be with someone intimately so I could go on forever and I'm going to leave it there for now and see where this conversation flows, but what a powerful month. Yeah. You brought in so much medicine just there. Um, I love, I wanted to kind of freeze frame the nature analogy. It's not really an, even an analogy. It's it, right. It's a reality as we get to know it. I really appreciate that because that was what saved me, you know, when I was growing up in my body and didn't have any words for it. So I would go out to the forest and I would see these kind of like life forms and expressions that looked like parts of my body. And, and the forest really taught me about these things. And so when you say the penetrative roots and seeing penetration as something that can be like nourishing and deep and slow and actually build strength and support things, that's that really changed my mind very early on from having been penetrated having been sexually assaulted and and i've been on the receiving end of perpetrative right penetration and i've been on the receiving end of like extremely nourishing penetration so it's like it's it's this amazing power that can change based on the relationship it has to itself right the the body that has the penetration energy moving through it how it relates to those roots inside of it and that's what excited me the most. Like I saw those faces as well when we were going into that. To see men who have overcoupled their nature, which is like a masculine penetrative nature with I'm toxic, I'm violent. It brings me pain to see that because that nature is part of our medicine. That's, that's part of the masculine medicine. It's how we learn how to relate to it and wield it and change its shape that's what no one teaches us how to do with the medicine and so 
it's exciting and it's, it's my next question for everybody to, to consider right now i'm really curious about that uncoupling for all of you like specifically your own masculine nature not your conditioning your nature what's come through your body naturally that you didn't ask for it just came through you know through puberty and afterwards what did you once overcouple with that that made you hate that part of yourself and what is now starting to uncouple what's starting to transform in your relationship to that part right so this masculine piece that you disliked or judged or were even ashamed of because of how other people use it how is that changing for you from this nine month practice if it is it's okay if it's not but i'm curious if it is what you could share with us Go ahead, Maddie. Uh, great question. Um, your questions always are so big and uh, a little bit overwhelming. But what does come to mind is I feel like I've really overcoupled myself from that, like noticing it as kind of an outside or semi external rather than this is who I am. This is what I should act on. This is who I should be and this is how I am and kind of separating myself more so from that and noticing it. And I think that's been a big part of your work that you've brought to me that's really helped that noticing and, you know, that I am not this and I am not that. And, uh, yeah, that's been really transformative and beautiful because, you know, if I'm having that kind of testosterone masculine experience from the work that we've done together, you know, not only can I notice that and, you know, sit with it and try and really consciously decide if I want to be that or act that way. But you've also kind of, you know, this pathway to the womb space has also kind of come in as kind of an, I guess I'll say an alternative to identifying with that masculine testosterone experience. So that's been amazing. So what Maddie's saying is really important. He's talking about this overall practice and philosophy that I have with seeing this thing as not you, but something moving through you. So when he's saying like, okay, once this whole masculine force, I just thought was me. Now I have this awareness that, okay, there's me, the witnesser. And then there's the masculine force, the energy, the nature moving through me. I get to choose in that moment of separation, I actually gain choice, right? I gain choice and agency about how I relate to that. How does it move through me? Where do I take it? What kind of shows or sexual experiences do I put it in front of? How do I lay it down at night? And this womb space piece that he's speaking is a practice we do where you learn how to find the space inside of you that's very soft, where a womb could have formed but didn't because you had testosterone instead. And that that space is still a place for that penetrative, external, masculine energy to go in and spiral. It becomes like a yin, like a femininity that go that goes into you, like the penetration into the soil we're talking about. It moves up from your genitals and go into your lower belly and from there into your heart and from there through your arms and your breath and your tears and all these things. So he's really talking about this, what I see as a very shamanic and psychedelic practice of relating to your masculine energy rather than identifying with it. And so I, I love that you brought that in. Thank you. Ian, I see you jotting something down and I'm calling on you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try, I like, feel like a, a cork I could just pop and, and have so much to say about this. I think that this was the big aha for me is that, I mean, I could go down big rabbit holes about beliefs about it, but I think the system is very much designed to, to tie men up in knots in connection to this energy because I think it's actually our, our strength and that it's our power. We talk about this power. And, you know, I think it's in the collective consciousness, the dangerous, it's dangerous. It hurts people. It's bad. It's uncontrollable. It's all these things. And as we talked about on the podcast episode, this is our inner fire. And when we don't play with this inner fire, we don't know how to use it. We don't know how to wield it. We don't know how to focus it. And that's really what I'm learning is like, this is the fire. And when I focus it to, to penetrate, it's so powerful. It's, it's my ultimate power. And I had like this dangerous hurt people coupled in there. 
and I'm in it right now, it's still rippling of the world needs me to have this fire to work with. The world needs me out there penetrating, serving, confident, not hiding, being big. And as I get more and more connected to this energy and, and, and the ability to access it, it's just like, I feel bigger. I feel I can go out there and, you know, go give that talk in front of people. I can give this course and teach other men. I can, you know, I can do it as I connect more and more to this power and I uncouple this dangerous it's going to hurt people. It's like, no, this is going to liberate people. This is going to create change in the world. This is the fire for me to share. Uh, it's, it's like, it's everything for me right now. And I, and I'm, I'm so excited to be on my own journey and know that I'll be able to share and work with other men. So much there. So one thing I wanted to bring in for the listeners is we keep using this word penetrate. And I know a lot of people are going to get triggered by that. And I'm going to try to hopefully uncouple some things for you listening when we say penetrate, we're talking about the energetic movement, right, of something into something. We're not just talking about sex here, how we walk into a room, how we look at you with our eyes, how our voice extends into a conversation. Like the testosterone filled body is a penetrative force. That's just what, what testosterone does. And this is why I said my trans male friends have told me more about this than I could have even put into words because they've experienced this as adults from having female biology for 20, 30 years. And then suddenly going into a more masculine male biology, they have also felt this penetrative force move through them. And that was that was really lit me up. It was 2012. And I met my still very, very close friend uh, who was just in the beginning of his transition from female to male. And as he got on testosterone, I remember a couple months into his experience, all this penetrative force started coming through. Like his clitoris started growing. His sexual energy got up to his skin. He like felt his hair standing up. He felt this irritation and aggression. He felt this quickness, this fastness. His hands were like actually on fire. They were hot. And he touched me one day and it was like a glove that came out of a wood stove. <laughs> you know, like his body was on fire. That's what testosterone does. And it was shocking to see it and to experience it. And, and he's very embodied. So he was able to like express this to me as it was happening. But he, I remember he said one day to me, I can never hate men again. I said, why? And he's like, I totally get it now. And, he just, and it, we just, I knew what he meant. And it's what really, you know, that was what, 11 years ago, that seed was planted in me and it took all this time to penetrate my soils and like grow into some understanding of language. And somatics helped a lot. But when Ian is saying penetration and I'm saying it and Zach is saying it, we're talking about the way energy moves. And when a body is filled with testosterone, energy moves outwards. That's just what it's meant to do. It's a catalytic hormone that pushes things outwards. That's why a clitoris becomes a penis when it's testosterone. Okay. Testosteronized, we'll call it. So I'm just saying this so we can understand the energy moving outwards is what we're talking about. Another word, power. We played with this a lot, power and domination, and how those two are overcoupled. Because again, very few of us men or women or anyone listening have the experience of seeing men in the world who use their power in a way that nurtured and supported people. Most of us have the example or the actual like re received experience of a man's power dominating people, isolating people, breaking up families, destroying experiences. So when Ian's saying this thing like, everyone thinks this is bad. Everyone thinks this is bad because people get hurt by the unconscious masculine because bad things will come from that. Yet inherently in itself, that nature isn't good or bad. It's just nature. It's how we relate to it that makes it good or bad or, you know, or painful or, or nurturing. So I wanted to bring that in as people listening uh, can understand like the depths of these words for us and the embodiment of these words and the energy of these words for us and, and what that might mean. We're going to keep flowing. I know we're going to go over time, but I just want to check in. Um, they can edit this part out or keep it in if they want. Steven, are you able to stay 15 extra minutes? I thought you had to go. You go okay, awesome. So come, come next. What's going on for you? Yeah, this is feeling super juicy to me right now. And I'm remembering a conversation I had this summer with a group of women where this whole idea of masculinity, femininity came up. Do we even need these labels? Do they serve? And I did bring up the word penetration. 
And I could see the fear that came up in the circle. And I asked, how does it feel to hear that? And one of the women, tears started coming to her eyes and she said, it, it hurts a lot just to hear that word. And that was when my heart opened up to her. And I said, can we just be in this together? Because there has been so much hurt around this. Like you said, when this force, when this energy is unconscious and it is acted upon, it comes out sideways. And I can trace that in my own life. I can trace how my story that if I share my desire, my true desire, it will be too much. It will get rejected, has created a shutdown of that desire. But in shutting it down, the energy is still there. So where does it go? It goes into trying to get what it wants anyways, backhandedly through manipulation. And so to me, these circles is where we can take responsibility for the ways that we may have been acting unconsciously, but we don't do it out of shame. We do this out of loving support and we come together in this brotherhood. And that's why when people ask me, what is men's work about? This is one of the answers I would give. When we, when we talk about these things, when we get real with each other, when we cry and we say, oh my gosh, I feel so much grief over this missing experience that I had or this way that I behaved and we can be in that and support each other, then I think we can then act in a larger society in a way that creates that repair. You know, and I wanted to bring that word in repair because conflict has been such a powerful topic talking about power and and conflict this year i mean wow to get to see that and i'll just briefly comment on it to see conflict in a way that can actually generate connection rather than create even more rupture more disconnection is always a reminder to me always a reminder of what is possible amongst men and i really appreciated that this year and i appreciated the space being held in such a way to encourage each person to get into their own body and recognize that when there's conflict with another person it's not about the other person it's about what is brought up in our in our own system and so both with masculinity how we relate to it how we relate to conflict these are pieces i just see so intertwined and was a big part of the practice, uh, getting to witness that and doing it within myself throughout the year. Mm, so much, so much medicine there. Ooh, you know, I, I wrote down shutting it down. It goes nowhere, right? It doesn't make it go. It, it doesn't like shut down and then dissipate. It shuts down and actually gets potent and it gets compressed. And like you said, it comes out sideways in all these really unconscious ways. And the it I'm referring to that Stephen was talking about is that masculine nature. It's our nature. Anyone that has more testosterone in their body than they have estrogen will feel that nature come through. And it's how we relate to it. It's not about damning it. It's not about shaming it. It's not about repressing it. It's about relating to it. And that's what really transforms these old opinions and realities of what it means to be a man in the world into something new, into something even what I've found in this group, very naturally androgynous, like a very a flexibility between the feminine and masculine, where you're not just fixed in one, but they just get to move through you the way they want to. That's like real liberation. So I just I love that you brought that in. I'm so moved, so moved by that. I need to keep going because I just want to keep hearing you and other people. I mean, I want the other two to talk, but I'm going to keep going uh, instead of uh, going in my own poetic response to you, Stephen. Zach, what are you feeling? Coming off of mute. Um, I am so excited about this question. There's something in my body that's just elated. I was, you asked me before we started this, like, how am I feeling? I said floaty. Now it's more of this like expansive, I'm still floating, but it's an expansive excitement. Uh, this is the first large scale men's group that I've been part of that focuses on nourishing the feminine. And that is something that I overcoupled that being feminine makes me less masculine, right? That's a huge experience in my body. I grew up very feminine. I love dancing and spinning and doing all these things. And I remember my siblings on the youngest of five all saying it's okay if you're gay and i'm like okay i know it's okay if i'm gay and why is that even a question i'm fucking five 
<laughs> like, why are you like bringing that up? Let me just exist and make my own decisions. And I think ultimately it was for them to feel comfortable that I was feminine, that they were bringing that up. So to bring this to now to like our present time or approximately present time during this nine month group, I was building this, this space that I've, I've shared briefly about. And I remember going to Home Depot with my face shaved and looking more feminine and having longer hair down to my shoulders. And I enjoy painting my nails and wearing fur coats and things that are known as feminine. And the men at Home Depot would look at me like, I don't belong. And then I would show them my project that I'm doing. And they're like, oh, okay. And it like, gave me some kudos, right? And then I grow a beard and I wear a fur coat. And then I get the head nods. Like, yeah, bro. Like those types of like brotherly love. And I'm like, this is so interesting that everyone's over over coupling like femininity with less than. It's not even less than masculine. It's like, why are why am I not a person if I'm more feminine? So I during this nine months, learning all of these somatic practices with everyone and sharing them and feeling them. I had two experiences that blew my mind that I'm so thankful I had you all in my life, my life to support and just know that I had a community. One was I was dating this woman and we sat and I really trusted her and we sat with a ketamine therapy together. And in that therapy, I sat there and just fully trusted that whatever came up was going to be healthy for me. And what came up was this well of love and femininity and support and protectiveness. And I felt it through my entire body. And in that, the, the word I use is divine masculine because I don't have another one for it, but I don't normally use that terminology. It felt like so much love, like this like king-like energy of I just want to care and love everyone in my femininity and my masculinity. And to bring that even farther, I went to this retreat called Catskill Rendezvous, which I'm sure Alexandra will be happy that I'm plugging. And it was predominantly women. It was like 35 women and four men, and two of those men were partnered. And to be one of those men that was not partnered and live in that feminine energy, watching women just dance and sing and flow, where I like rigid structure in my life, but they were just flowing. And I realized that by loving my feminine, by being more feminine, it actually makes me feel more masculine. It makes me feel that I can live into my body and feel so much safer in being a man where I, I trust now that when I grow into a group of men, I can trust that I'm safe. Where in the past, I overcoupled, if I grow into a group of men, someone's going to try to hurt me unless I fawn. So this, this beautiful experience of being supported and supporting 25 men has really brought this into my body. That's so beautiful. And the piece I just want to add to that just for people listening is one thing we work with a lot in the nine months is uncoupling masculine from man and uncoupling feminine from woman and really releasing gender, releasing idea, identity, all those things and going to the felt sense of the body you're in how does the feminine flow in you and how do you relate to it? How does the masculine flow in you and how do you relate to it? So Zach's like giving us a beautiful painting a picture of how he relates to the feminine in him and how that in a way, not even in a way, but it, it, it like um, not, not solidifies even the wrong word. It like secures the masculine. And I was seeing that in a lot of the men when we did some of the physical um, meditations with our bodies, with the feminine and masculine and going between the two is once they were totally just enriched in their feminine energy, however that looked, right? The masculine was more secure and then the feminine was more secure. So these, these two seeming dualities secured each other. And through that security, something new blossomed. And that's where the, the plant analogies come from. Because you see a flower, it's like the perfect image for what we're talking about. It's like the seed, right? Which is very male. It's like the, it's like the, the semen. And then it, roots penetrate the womb of the earth and then it penetrates up to the sky like a shaft and then this incredible most delicate petal opens and then penetration of the pollen comes out of that and it's this whole experience of <clears throat> it's not fixed in masculine or feminine it's a whole other creature because it's in relationship with both the masculine and feminine and that's what really excites me about this work with men is to even like leave the identity of men 
and just feel what's it like when those both of those energies come through me and are secure in me and then something new gets to emerge from that like that's we know biologically male and female biologies create a child so that's what happens in our bodies when these energies come in something new gets born like constantly so i love just that whole image you painted really helped me feel that navid where do you go with this Hmm. And there's so much wisdom in this group. This is uh, really exciting, y'all. Um, I can't wait for the next podcast we do. <laughs> um, I go into um, Zach's kind of comments, and I'm I'm noticing right now, like I've always thought that I was really in touch with my feminine, but what might be more true is that I had all these overcouplings around the masculine that what I thought was being in touch with my, with my feminine was actually just repression of the masculine. And um, I, during this podcast, I've, I made this, um, I was in this herbalism class with a lot of women. Uh, like we've been saying, I tend to be in spaces with a lot of women, um, but I don't show up kind of in that masculine way I show up a little bit in that suppressed way and like more recently I'm learning to like be more of that penetrative force in, in some of the healthy ways we're talking about I made this com comfy comfy salve and I've been rubbing it on my womb uh, I wanted to make sure to bring this in because this was the other piece of this um experience that was so um that i'm really gonna take away with me I, I didn't know i had a womb and and i hated it Luis. when you're like okay put your hand on your womb and don't go down we did these tantric practices don't like go down to your penis yet or to your by the way like touching yourself in a group of men in a conscious way compared to like pulling out playboy magazines and like all secretly with my friend and and um you know, it's such, that was really moving as well. And you had us touch our womb and I, I, I just was flooded with charge. I was like, no, I don't want to. I don't want that place, the womb space. That's the, my blockage. Like I, that's how I dissociate from my cock is right through that womb. And you're having me reconnect with it. No way. I don't freaking want that. And yet somehow in that womb space, which I've been rubbing very gently during this podcast, and it's become my, it's become my favorite practice. Um, somehow in that womb space, I am finding the, my queerness. It's not just the masculine. It's not just the feminine. Um, I, I had a, a lover who we broke up during this this nine months multiple times and and y'all really supported me through these like over couplings that existed and she used to rub all this beautiful oil on her body and i was so jealous every day she would just rub oil and she's beautiful and she'd be all oily I'm like no like uh. and they're like i can't do that that's not me and then we started this womb practice i'm like wait i can do that and i do want to do that and that like i want to reconnect with that um with that part of me so it's been such a like taking back what feels like mine um i'm going to add one more piece because it feels really i've i've wanted to be on your podcast forever Luis. I, it's like a dream so the, the fact that it's manifested it is so exciting um <laughs> i see ian also putting his hands up um the, the main over coupling that i want to name for me and i'm naming this um not just for the sake of the podcast, this is really like I'm, I'm wanting to be conversational with the, with the six of us here. Like um, I have overcoupled um, masculine with fighting and, and maybe even the fight response in terms of the trauma responses. And um, so when something uh, challenging happens in my life, I tend to freeze and collapse and fighting. I've just said, that's just so wrong. I've seen it in the WWE characters and I don't like it. I've seen it uh, as a kid being bullied. There was once like someone just stole my phone and I like, my friends like, why didn't you like fight them? I'm like, no, like that's not, that's not for me. Um, it happens as, as, as an adult, I was going for a walk and someone 
ripped my walking stick from me and, and started pressing it up against my chest and I just collapsed. And, and I don't want to, um, I had shame in the moment. I don't have shame anymore. It's more that this overcoupling of fighting has been so suppressed. And the ways that shows up in my life is that right now, as I'm kind of trying to rebuild through career and vocation, I'm finally thawing this fight response. And yesterday I woke up at 4 a.m. and I'm like, you know what? This charge that's here that wants me to like penetrate myself into the world and fight myself back into the world, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. Like it belongs to, and I'm going to really move myself into the world and fight, fight for my dignity. Um, and with that, I, I will share that I'm going to do a slow somatic men's group in person here in, in Boulder, Colorado, and, and would love anyone listening to, to reach out and join this because it's going to, it's so important for me. Even me saying this is a part of me fighting for my dignity, that, that my voice matters and that I have what it takes. So thank you for this gift, y'all. Thank you for all that, Naveen. You know, as you were saying about fighting, um, like fighting into the world, I was, again, I was seeing that flower extending to the sun. And one way that I teach the fight response is exactly that. It's just something in me wants to push out. That's all it is. It's not about aggression or violence or dominating. It's something wants to push and extend out the arms, the tongue, the spit, the yell, whatever it is. And if we think of a plant, it's extending. You know, when you look at the forest and we say, oh, nature is so peaceful, you're looking at like thousands of beings like fighting for the sun. <laughs> That's what we're all seeing. And so the diversity of that, right, it, it blossoms not from everyone avoiding and repressing their fight, but from conflict. You know, the forest is a painting of conflict. And conflict can be really fertile and even highly relational. Right. Like, was it was Zach? You were saying that, right? No, Stephen, one of you were saying about conflict earlier. Which one was that? Stephen? Yeah, it, exactly. It's like we saw in this group when conflict ar would arise, how fertile it became to create intimacy and connection and depth and trust and love and all these things. Whereas before, just like Navid saying with like overcoupling something wrong with fight and now with fight, the same thing with conflict. Um, but again, nature teaches us that conflict is how it thrives so well so it, it's interesting to consider that that piece what i want to do because i mean we're so over time but i i'm loving it so much that it's hard to stop uh i would love us all to just in one minute share what about yourself you love more now after the nine months and how that's affecting your life your relationships your relationship to self And if you need time, take time. <laughs> but when you feel ready, just raise your hand and we can share. And that's how we're going to close this out. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah, I, for me, I just love my masculine energy more. And in this uncoupling from penetration being a bad thing, we would not exist. Nothing would exist without penetration. It is just as much needed as anything else so for me it's 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 loving that nature and seeing and finding the healthy aspects zach yeah i feel so much more safety in my body after these nine months and i think a large part of it is just knowing that i'm not alone knowing that i am unique in my experiences only in the minutia of it but on the larger scale, we've all had so many similar experiences as men growing up in this world. So I walk around the world with a lot more safety, knowing that I can protect myself in the ways I need to. And then one more piece just to add to that, because I want to mention this for the, the more of the viewers than anything. In therapy as a whole, I find that people or therapists treat clients like numbers are like they have to keep a separation and i've noticed with you luis in this group and knowing you that there's such deep presence and such deep love that can be felt through a screen that i have never seen in therapy 
to the point where people, if they meet me in person, they're like, I can't be your therapist. Or if they, if I have them as a therapist, they can't be my friend. And you're just the opposite. Like we became friends first. And then you're like, do you want to test out my therapy? I'm like, yes, I would love to. Let's see what that's like. Let's go for it. So I'm so thankful for you and your ability to be so present and so I dare I say in love. I mean, I'm I'm putting words on you, but like in love with the people you talk to. So thank you for being you. Thank you, sweetie. Feels good. <laughs> and I am in love with them all. So you're spot on. I figured. You, even the ones <laughs> that piss me off, I'm in love with them. <laughs> I know. I remember Naveed as a whole saying all these things about how much he hates this group, but like in the most loving way. Yeah. And I just see your screen giggling of like, oh, I love you. I love that you hate this. Thank you for sharing. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. It made me giggle every time. Yeah, you missed it. Yesterday, Luis, I was saying like, I am done with Luis. I'm repulsed by him. He just don't want his teachings anymore. Um, but here I am the day after. So I guess <laughs> I, I moved the charge you moved in terms time. of, in terms of my um, one minute or less than um, I love, I love my, um, I love my cock more. And I love both the, like my soft cock and I love the erect, like I'm here, penetrative cock as well. And, and that's really big stuff to even say that um, about, about my body, about my penis. Whew. Thank you, Naveen. Go ahead, Stephen. So it's feeling true for me in terms of something I really love about myself is my increasing capacity to hold the parts of myself that I was really terrified to hold. And it's a continuous learning process. But at this point, I feel more resourced to hold my deepest fear and deepest shame and be with it rather than dissociate and run away from it. And while it's not necessarily comfortable there is a relationship there and that relationship i've noticed has come from being relational with other people i tried for so long to figure this out myself read another self-help book watch another documentary meditate and all those things helped but i've noticed that so much of my inner pain happened interrelationally and so the healing also has got to happen in a re relationally. Love that so much. Couldn't agree more. Maddie, do you want to share anything? Always. <laughs> um, yeah, I think just I love myself more. Um, understanding my masculinity uh, has been really transformative. I've always struggled with with being a man and you know, the ways that I have seen men act in the world, it's been really hard to be that. And the men's group has definitely helped me accept that and understand it and love that. Um, and also, you know, it's helped me call in a space for my own femininity. Something we've talked about a lot is the outsourcing of femininity or that's come up and being able to stop doing that and make a, a home for my femininity inside myself and make a home for my masculinity inside me has just really increased uh, the love I have for myself. I love hearing all this and I'm thinking of my own as you're all sharing and it's, they're all very similar for me. I think the way I would wrap it up is I, I feel such a love for my own masculine in a way I didn't before and like a connection in a way I didn't before. And that's helping me really love other men. I, I'm noticing I walk into spaces and I'll have the same constricted feeling I normally have when I see a man, or especially when I walk into like an all man space, like a, a like an automotive garage. <laughs> this does tend to be like my biggest triggers. And I go in there, I'm like, I feel okay. Because I'm seeing this natural beauty that is masculine and some people are in relationship with it, some people aren't. And similar to Naveed, I repressed mine for most of my life and then called myself a feminist. And I'm learning now that it, that's really not the way to do it for me. For me, it's like I want to be in relationship with that as well as my feminine. And that feels so securing. So uh, I thank you all so much 
like to echo what was said earlier, so much wisdom in these bodies here. It just helps me, um, helps me understand why this was so potent. You know, we had like three times the bodies with three times the wisdom. And I'm so moved to have seen all of you, those of you listening who are in it, who aren't here with us right now, the, the courage it took to say things you didn't think you were ever allowed to say uh, publicly or in front of other men to that really that that's what moved the dial of our hearts in this nine month group and like navid said the slowness of it that's why the slowness had to come in we needed time to unfold and settle all the bigness that came up in these sessions so we could even have capacity for the next one so it didn't become like a strategy or a technique but it became like a culture and a way to relate and be together and that really happened so i'm i'm grateful and I really honor you all for coming on here and talking about your experiences publicly, you know, with like thousands of people that are going to listen and some people are going to disagree and some people are going to love it. And some people are going to sign up and some people are never going to sign up after hearing this. And so it's, I welcome all of it. And I, I'm grateful that you all came here to help me just get the message out about this group and how you experienced it. So um, with that, we're going to say goodbye. You can unmute and say bye for now. Thank you all so much. Goodbye for Bye, now. everyone. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louise. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath. And let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com.